אוקיי, בוקר טוב, שבוע טוב. Our show today is sponsored by Lior Leib, who is joining us here today, and CP Gian, yeah, and CP Gian, Leilu Nishmat, their mother, Tova Bat Natan, which was, you all said it was yesterday, so may the dear Torah be Leilu Nishmata. I chose, I asked Leora where her mother was from, and she told me, she told me that uh, her mother was from Romania. Uh, and as I have some oh. also connections to Romania, I chose, I thought that it would be nice to choose uh, a rabbi that came from Romania. Unfortunately, Romania was known for many, many things and not necessarily uh, in the rabbis that originated there. Uh, but there was one great rabbi of the 19th century that although he was not born in Romania, he was born in Poland, but uh, I think uh, he's, uh, he's best known for his time being served in Bucharest, uh, Romania capital. Uh, so uh, that is the Malbim. Malbim, that's the, uh, he used this acronym himself, uh, but he sent for Meir Leibush Ben Yechiel. His family name, his last name was Weiser, or Weiser, which means uh, uh, it comes from whitening in, in Yiddish, so Weiser, Weiser. And uh, it's interesting because it shows an accurate name that in Hebrew, Malbim is all very similar to making something white. Uh, Malbim, Malbim. I'm not sure if he, uh, was, uh, if he was trying to achieve uh, the similarity, but anyhow, uh, it's interesting to remember. So this is the Malbim. Almost no one knows him for his real name. If you would go around, ask about Meir, Yechi, Meir Leibush Ben Yechiel, no one knows what you are speaking about, but Malbim is very well known. So he was born in 1809 in Poland, in a small city. There would be many, many small cities in the story we are going to tell today, because he uh, wandered a lot. Unfortunately, most of them are in languages that I am not able to pronounce, neither to read. So it's supposed to be something like Volchisek. Volchisek. So it's a small city, and unfortunately, his father died when he was very young. So five or six, depends on what books you are reading, but he was very young. Uh, and it seems that it affected him strongly for the rest of his life because from there on, he would always stand for the orphans and the widows. That was a very strong line in his personality. And to be honest, many times it got him, it got him into big troubles because usually the orphans and the widows are not the strongest elements of the community. The strongest elements of the communities are the strong families, the rich families, which are not always, their interests are not always aligned with the interests of the widows and the orphans. And he's standing to the right of the, of the strangers and the, and the poor and the miserable uh, would many, many times get him into trouble. So that's the first thing to know about the Malbim. So he was, as I said, he was often in a very young age and he was taught by his father, meaning not his real father, but his stepfather, his uh, mother remarried, and his stepfather saw immediately that we are speaking about a, a, a wonder child, a prodigy, That's the, right? Uh, so a, a very wise, a very wise young boy, and he invested a lot in his schooling. Now, schooling, we have to understand, we speak on, in, on, on Poland in the beginning of the 19th century, there are no formal schools. There are haters, but the haters back then were usually for the children of the poor. If you were wealthy, you would give a private teacher for your child. You would not send him to the public haters. The public haters were, unfortunately, in most places, I'm sure there were many rabbis in the haters that were doing their best. But to be sincere and to say things as they were, the Haderim were usually meant by people that were not able to do anything else. And uh, they were infamous for violence, for, uh, for complete lacking of educational understanding. I mean, these were not places 
most, I, I, I didn't do statistics, but I think that it can be said that at least many, if not most, of the Torah scholars, the top Torah scholars, did not learn through the Hederim, but they were taught by private teachers in their homes. Now, his stepfather and his mother are doing the effort of uh, uh, teaching him privately, and he's writing about that he's in the first source, you can see, is from the introduction to the first book that he published, which is called Artsot Chaim, The Land of Life, and uh, and in it, it's very, very interesting. Uh, uh, in it, he has both a reminder of his father, which was called, as I said, Yechiel. So Chaim, Yechiel, Arzot Chaim, is a reference to his father, his real father. But in the book itself, in the Sefer itself, uh, there is, the, uh, I mean, he wrote it in three parts. So there is the middle of the Sefer. You can think about a Shulchan Aruch or a Gemara with a central text, and then one perush to the right, and one commentary to the left. So the main perush, uh, excuse me, the, the perush, he wrote himself, the body, the, text, the body of the text, and then a commentary to the right and a commentary to the left. It's the whole thing is his own doing. And the commentary to the right, he called Eretz Yehuda. So the book is named Arzot Achaim after his biological father, but Yehuda was the name of his stepfather. So he honored both of them in his first work, which I think is uh, is beautiful. Uh, and the book itself is a, a, a very interesting and important uh, read. Uh, it's like a, a, redemption, a, a rendering of the first part of the Shulchan Aruch, Orach Chaim. So that's about, the first part is about uh, waking up in the morning, washing your hands, uh, tzitzit, filling, uh, filling a uh, 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 tfila. So all of these are lachot which accompany the uh, the Jew as he wakes up. Uh, so he writes about that. It's a, a very deep. Uh, we'll read something from it later, but it's a very deep and lengthy scholarly work, but in a very I wouldn't say easy to understand. It's not easy to understand, but it is generally clear language, which is a, a big ma'ala. And when we speak about this type of books, usually they are very difficult to read. He is writing in a very clear style. Again, it is very scholarly, so it's not easy to read. But it is clear. If you are taking the time sitting and reading through it, you would understand. Uh, and... Uh, so that, that book was published in 1837. So while he was, if he was born in 1809, he was 28. That's a very nice book to publish when you are 28. And in the introduction, he writes the following, Elem katan rach v'yachid ha'iti lifnei av'imi. So I was a young and, uh, and uh, soft, a uh, uh, small boy in front of my mother, or Havi N-E-T, the light of my father was lacking. Odeno Beubo Beibo Niktaf, he was he died young. Hacharif Amuflag Batora, Moreno Rabbeinu Yechil Michel Zatzal. Tevorach Minashim, he says, blessed from all women would be my mother, Hatzadeket, Hatznua, Hamaskelet, what honor was he giving to his mother? Marat Simitzia Tichye, so she was still alive when he was writing this this safer. אשת אבי חורגי, הרב הגאון חריף וחקי בכל חדרי תורה. What honor you also give to his stepfather. You know that in many families it's not always easy, the relationship between the step-parent and the child. But here, obviously, it was a good match. So he says, my stepfather, he was a genius, uh, and uh, he is, he was still alive again in the time he published the first book. Uh, his knowledge in all rooms of Torah, Sana male sifra is like um, is like a library full of books. Kvod kedushat Torah Moreinu Reb Yehuda Leib Nero Yair. He was the Av Beidil Beir Moladeti when I, where I was born. He was the chief rabbi. I would say today. Minashim baoel. Now he, he returns to his mother. She would be blessed from all women of the tent. Asher yom vegam laila lo shachav liba. Neither at night nor at day. She was never asleep. 
Like a Kadosh Baruch Hu, we say, Lehavdil, I would say, Lo Yanum Velo Yishan Shom. So he felt that his mother was always taking care of him. Bimin Tzidka Temachani Yemina, Vetanahaleni Bemagle Tzedek, by her right hand, she would support me and walk me through the ways, through the right ways. Zichrali Eloka, Zichrala Elokai Letova, God, you should uh, remember that for her, for the good. Uveet Eoti Ben Shloshesre, כציפור בודד על כן החוכמה לבדי. Now when he was 13, he was such a genius and of such a type. He says when I was 13, there was nobody I could speak with. It was a small city, it was a small town. I don't know if 20 Jewish families, 30 Jewish families. These were simple people. We do not speak, it's not Vinna. This is a small town, very simple people. His stepfather was the chief rabbi. But again, even the chief rabbi of these type of places, it was... Uh, I don't know. I don't. I know nothing about the, the person that was his stepfather. But let's say not necessarily was the greatest genius of, of Torah of the generation. It was a rav? And there are very nice rav, rabbanim. I mean, I know some of them. Person, and which are not necessarily they are genius in Torah. They are nice guys. They can teach Torah. So when the child was six or seven or eight or nine or ten, there was something you could teach him. When he was thirteen, he says. I was like a, a, a bird standing alone on the roof. Gam rav rea vechaver lo ayali. I had no friend, no rav, no one, that, no fellow that I could speak with. It orera nafshi lekol kinor tshukat alimudim meitiv nagen beoznai. Listen to his poetic language. He says, I woke up to the violin singing the music of learning in my ears. So that he is referring here to the Midrash about David the Melech, sleeping and then being woke up by the Kinor David in the middle of night. So he says, I woke up when I was bar mitzvah and I heard the music of learning, but I couldn't put it to, to the act because there was no one that was able to teach me in the small city. גם נשמת התורה אשר התהלכה בקרב אבותיי מעולם, האירה את רוחי כאיש אשר יאור משנתו. He says, I was also woken up by the soul of the Torah that I inherited from my forefather. So he says, no, not only me that I'm such a genius. It was also because I came from a lineage. Now, again, he didn't know his father, but he said, I still felt the blood of my, the earlier generations in my veins. We will see. That would be another very strong line that would be a, 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 a part of the character of the Malbim. And that is his feeling of connection to earlier generations, that he feels that everything that he is doing is in order to defend the faith of his forefathers and to present them in the best light, teach them in the best way that he can do. So he says, I woke up as a man waking from his sleep. And when I woke up, I found the pen in my hand. So I began to write. Now we're speaking about a, a kid in the age of 13. He is beginning to write. Et beyadi, veshevet sofer mahir beyad yemini. Katavti, chidashti, be'arti, perashti. So he says, I wrote, I, I made comments, I explained. Uh, and Yad Hashem Alai Chazaka, the hand of God was strong upon me. Mishpa, and so again, he began to write his books, which he wrote many, many books. Uh, but he says, I wanted to print first this sefer that I wrote on Shulchan Aruch. It's not the first that he wrote, it's the first that he wanted to print. Why? Because Iyoto Le'inyan Dina, because it, it refers to Halacha, so it's most important. It would be of use to many people, he says. So he printed it when he was 28. Nowadays, printing is very easy. It's a, it's a matter of money, but it's very easy. Back then, printing would take a lot of time. So he says, it took me, he began to write it when he was 15. Now again, it's a very scholarly work. He began to write it when he was 15, and he wrote it for 30, 13 years before he was able to print it. Now, I gave here a sample from the Sefer, <laughs> uh, but, but I don't want to read it inside because I'm worried that we will not have enough time, and he's such a, an interesting person. So I will just say it 
uh, בעל פה. He is referring you to the question of נטילת ידיים in morning. And he says, there are two reasons, uh, three reasons, but basically two reasons given by the poskim why one has to wash his hands when he wakes up. So one reason is as a preparation for tefillah, because you need to do tefillah chakrit. And as a preparation for tefillah, you should wash your hands. The second reason he gives, uh, being not him, but given by the poskim, is that while someone is asleep, there is a, a bad spirit, a ruach ra'a, that is on the hands, And that's why you need not only to wash, but wash three times, because that's the way to remove the Ruach Ra'a, the bad spirit. Now, as because of the Ruach Ra'a, the, the Poskim wrote, that one should not touch food before washing his hands. After waking up, one should not touch food before uh, uh, washing hands. Now, what happens if he does touch food? So there is an opinion that the food should be thrown away. The Malbim did not agree. Very interesting. He did not agree. And he is saying, you know, I looked through the Rambam and they couldn't find anything written about Ruach Ra. Nothing about bad spirit in the Rambam. Now we all would, yeah, we would not be surprised. The Rambam was uh, somewhat of a rationalist uh, 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 posek. And this type of reason, such as bad spirit, Ruach Ra did not speak to him. So Rambam is speaking about preparation for tefillah, which made a lot of sense to him, that before tefillah you should wash your hands. So that's, that makes sense. So the Malbim says, now I would still recommend first washing your hands and only then touching food because there are a whole group of Rabbanim that said that that's what you should do. But if the food was already touched, do not throw it. Why? Because there is the opinion of the Rambam saying that there is no bad spirit, or at least that in our times there is no bad spirit, and uh, you can keep the food. Now, again, this is a very minor sika. I don't want you to go into his lengthy dis discussions about tzitzit or about feeling, because it would be much beyond the scope of our shiru. But what we see here is, I think, very interesting, because as we will see later, he was a staunch traditionalist. That is not, it is not a, a, any type of a reform, very, very far from it. Uh, he is standing for tradition, tradition. But nonetheless, I, I don't know exactly why, but my suspicion is someone who grew up as an orphan is not so keen on throwing food. So that is, now that is a suggestion, I mean, that is a speculation. I, I, if you would uh, quote me outside, I would deny it. <laughs> it's, it's recorded. But, uh, but one can wonder, right? One, one is allowed to wonder if that was maybe part of the reason why he fought so strongly uh, for not throwing food. Okay, so I thought it's interesting. Uh, and let's uh, let's continue. You have the source sheet in front of you. If you don't later to sit inside, and of course you are uh, invited. Now he was uh, he became an autodidact, as we can all assume, because as he said, he had no rabbi in the small city. His uh, mother didn't send him uh, to a big yeshiva. Just not what happened. So he was just sitting with himself in the Beit Midrash and learning. And learning whatever came to his hands. By the way, it included both Torah, but also sometimes in his Sepharim, he suddenly quotes Kant. Now, he le didn't learn in any place that was Mesudar, that was organized, no formal study, not Kodesh, not Chol. But it seems that he was, he was again, he was a genius. Uh, some of you may know the type. People that everything written that comes into their hands, They read, good, bad, a phone book, anything that would be, they would read. So he was this type of a person. He had a very good memory. So I guess that some copy of Kant fell into his hands and he read it. So he, I'm, I'm not sure if it was in German. I don't, I'm not sure. I mean, he was able to speak little German, but I, reading Kant in the original is extremely difficult. So I would guess that some type of a, a Polish or a Russian translation fell into his hands. Uh, but it's very interesting. So he was able uh, to quote Kant. Anyhow, he was, so he was an autodidact and also very independent in his thinking. Again, because he was not indoctrined. I'm not sure that's the right word. Uh, but he, he didn't go, if you go to a big yeshiva, then they make you into whatever form, whatever more they use, right? But if you learn by yourself in some Beit Midrash, you grow up to be a very independent person, which can go many, many ways. 
in his case, it went very, in a very, to very interesting uh, directions as we shall see. He was married as was accepted back then in the uh, ripe age of 14. Uh, I mean, again, uh, those of us that came from the same region, uh, it's not only in the beginning of the 19th century, it's also in the end of the 19th century. And that's, that's how things were done. Uh, so he was uh, he was married in the age of 14 to the daughter of the richest person in the in the village in the village, uh, which show you that he already was very much respected. I mean, people knew that he is the genius sitting in the Bet Midrash and I don't know writing. <laughs> so he was known to be a genius. So the richest man of the community wanted his daughter to be married to him. Unfortunately, two years. And according to some accounts, I was not able to verify it. So I, I maybe I didn't check it enough. Uh, but some accounts speak about two years and two children. Uh, later, they got divorced. Now that also happens sometimes when you marry two kids at the age of fourteen. Uh, and the reason to marry them is because one is rich and the other is smart, which may work but also may not work. Uh, and what happened there, according again, according to some of the accounts, I obviously we have no real historical evidence, but according to some of the accounts, his wife said, you know, you're already 16. Why are you sitting and learning all day? Go walk. And uh, he refused. He refused because as we see from his account, he was very much into Torah learning. So he refused to go to work. And he says, no. We got married, and I guess we would live from the money of your family. Uh, she was not happy uh, with uh, with this direction, and in the end, uh, as I said, they, they got divorced. Uh, so that was uh, that was one uh, one thing that happened. Now that also may affected his life. Again, these are speculations. All psychology is speculations, even when we speak about people that are in front of our eyes. So when you try to analyze people 200 years ago, obviously everything that I'm saying is speculations, but I saw it in more than one place. During the rest of his life, I said earlier that he had a strong affection to the orphans and the widows. We also have to admit that it seems that he had an aversion from rich people. And again, one can wonder about... Uh, the cause and effect of uh, his relationship with his first father-in-law and his wife, and maybe his feeling of uh, unease uh, with people that are very much into the Gashmi, uh, into uh, this world, and do not respect enough Torah, Torah learning, spirituality, etc. So again, this, these would be lines that, again, we have to say, they would hunt him throughout his life. He would pay very high prices for uh, for uh, these tendencies uh, that he had. He didn't have any siblings, as far as I know. I mean, from, from the second marriage, but not from the first. I mean, he was he was the only son of his of his uh, biological father, as far as I know. Yeah, as far as I know. Okay, uh, when he was 18, so again, he was married when he was 14, divorced at the age of 16, and uh, married again at the age of 18. So that's very quick. So he was married again in the age of 18, uh, and that he left the city. Maybe I should have said it earlier. After you divorce uh, the daughter of the richest person in the village, you do not stay in the village. That's not the way it works in Poland of the beginning of the day. No, you are out. So he was out, uh, although his father was the rabbi of the city. But, well, uh, so he's out and he's going to a place called, again, I can read it, Lunchich. So he's going to Lunchich and there in the age of 18, he marries and this time he is marrying the daughter of the city's rabbi. So no money, but the right attitude, which I guess is a better re receipt for a, a good marriage life. Uh, he stayed uh, married with her to the rest of his life. Uh, so he's sitting there in Lunchich and he's learning. Now again, his father-in-law, his second father-in-law, is not necessarily the richest person, but he's supporting him because he understands the value of Torah learning and he sees that he, he has a star here. You do not send such a person to the stock market, right? Because there is someone here that can affect the Yahadut to the long run. So he's letting him sit down and learn and write. 
And at the age of 24, as I said, he wants to publish the first book, The Arzot Achaim, that we saw earlier. Now, he is going in a grand tour throughout Europe, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, and he is trying to achieve two goals. The formal goal, over the table goal, is to get a skamot, right, a gimmins, to his safer. And he's getting an askamo from the Khatam Sofer, for example. So it's a, a, a very important, a very important person, a very important book. So he's getting very good askamot, but a part of that, a part of that, he also wants to find what was back then called the Shtel. Right? So he wants to find a position as a rabbi. If you would stay in Lunchich to the rest of his life, it's a very small city. You have nothing to, to look for there. But he begins to make his tool, he's making connection, he's speaking with people, he's speaking with great rabbis, and, you know, after 10 minutes talking to him, you know that in front of his stands a very talented young man. And indeed, uh, in, the, in his way, he meets with a rab called Rav Shlomo Zalman Mitiktin, Rav Shleime Mitiktin. Now, he was the rabbi of Breslau, which is a city in Germany. Now, Germany was speaking about the beginning of the 19th century, and the this it's the beginning of reform, the reform movement, not only the beginning, they are already beginning to ride. And uh, in Breslau, the no, it's not Breslau, Breslau is, is Ukraine. Breslau, that's the name. Uh, and it's a it's it was it was a good Jewish city. Now, the Rav, as I said, was very old, Rav Shlomo Zalman uh, Mitiktin. He was the Rav of the city, but he was very old. And the Balei Batim were beginning to look for an assistant rabbi that one day would become the rabbi. But the Balei Batim do not want the uh, another rabbi of the old school, of the old type. They want a new type of rabbi. And the man that they put their eye on is no other than Avraham Geiger. Avram Geiger would better, he was not so known back then, but he would later be known as the head and the founder in many ways of the reform movement in Germany. And uh, a very radical, a very radical man. And they want him to become the assistant rabbi. Now you can only imagine. So we have this Shlomo Zalman Mitiktin, who is a, an old school rabbi. And you'd put someone like Avram Geiger as his, uh, as his assistant rabbi, <laughs> taking aside the religious issues. That is, there, you know, there is an issue in the Torah to plow with an ox and a donkey together. And the Mepharshim explained, because one is going very fast. The ox is very strong, it's going very fast. The donkey is very slow. Both are being agonized if you are putting them to plow together. So <laughs> Shlomo Zalman Tiktin and this Avram Geiger guy as, as rabbis of the same community, that is Shor Vechamur Yachdav. Now, uh, the Malbim is making friends with the old rabbi. So one, he is, and he would be throughout all of his life, a very bitter opponent of Reform Judaism. Very bitter, very strong fighter against, and... Uh, so he's, be he's beginning his career there, uh, and he's trying to convince the Balebatim not to take Avram Geiger. Obviously, there is a second reason, and that is, do not take him. I am a very nice guy here for the taking, and, and Reb Shlomo is, 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 uh, he thinks that I'm great. So why wouldn't you appoint me? Now, unfortunately, Breslau at the time was beyond saving, uh, and, uh, and he didn't succeed. He didn't succeed. And Geiger was indeed chosen as the assistant rabbi there. And, but Reb Shlomo Zalman Mitikting, seeing uh, that he is someone that is designated for greatness, so he picked for him a position in a nearby city uh, named Varshana. Now again, not Varsha, Varshana. Worse now, I think. I think the way they, they, they pronounce it, worse now. So worse now. Uh, and is uh, and is walking there now at the same time. Uh, so we are already in the in the forty, <laughs> uh, the forties of the nineteenth century. So in eighteen forty four, there is a very famous convention in Brunswick uh, of the reform movement, in which they decided that uh, you are allowed to marry a non Jew uh, as long. As uh, as long as the, the children are also getting Jewish education, that was 
uh, or they are allowed to get Jewish education. I think that was the that was the condition. That was the tnai. So if the children would be allowed to get Jewish education, then uh, the person can marry uh, as long as he is a monotheist. No, no, no pagans. What pagans were moving around in 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 Europe at the time? So obviously that was just a, a all a, a complete permission uh, to marry non-Jews. Uh, as you can uh, imagine, there was an outcry from the rabbinim of the time. You know, the, the, back, and again, back then, everyone was called a rabbi because the dividing lines were not clear yet. So it was like a machloikes. You had a bet shamay, bet hilel. So you had some rabbis that agreed that you'd marry an anju, and some rabbis that think that you're not allowed to marry an anju. But obviously, that was the time in which the dividing lines began to form. Because in the usual machloket, right, if I'm saying one thing and the rabbi in the next room is saying another thing, then I may think that I'm right and he's stupid, but I would not excommunicate him for that. But here, they begin to ban each other, and it is immediately, it is becoming clear that uh, this is not just a regular machloket between rabbanim, but there is a whole new movement that is being formed or reformed. Uh, and that is, uh, so that is 1844, that left a very strong mark on uh, on the Malvim. And as I said earlier, he would spend the rest of his life doing many, many things. But one of them is fighting every expression of reform, and not only reform, but also what was called back then, Haskalah. Uh, Askala, now Askala in itself is a nice word, Askala or enlightenment, uh, it means uh, learning uh, new things. As I said, he himself read Kant. So his problem was not with learning secular studies, his problem was with devaluing Torah and uh, putting on top of it secular studies. That was what he was fighting against. And uh, so that, as I said, was in, in 18. Uh, 44. Now, he's beginning to write, let's wait for a minute, in 1846, he's moving from Versailles, Versauna to a place called Campen. Uh, now, it's not Champagne in, in French, okay? It's uh, another small city in, uh, in, uh, in, in Eastern Poland, uh, uh, Western, no, excuse me, Western Poland, Eastern Germany. So these are the type of places you cannot even say where exactly they are because they change hands uh, every uh, every few years. Uh, so it's, an, it's a city named, small city named Kempen. Now, again, he is sitting there. It's a small village. There is no one to speak with in his own level. So he has a lot of free time in his hands. He's not giving shiurim. To the, I mean, he is. He's giving Shabbat Shuvat Rasha. He's giving Shabbat Agadol Rasha. And if someone is shachtening a, a chicken and there is a question of kashrut, they come to him and a few these type of questions. But basically, that's it. So he has no money and a lot of time in his hands. And he sees one thing very clear because he already went around very much. So he's beginning to understand. Again, nowadays, you open the internet and you get news from all over. But back then, you would sit in your own small village and very few people had a general view, a wide point of view on the state of things in Yahadut. So some of the great rabbis get the sense that things are going, excuse me, down the tubes, but not everyone got the memo. Many rabbis were still just holding. But the Malbim understood that the situation of the young generation is extremely bad and something has to be done and he has a lot of time in his hands now he cannot publish youtube shiurim because there is no youtube back. but what what can you do in order to educate if you, you don't have anyone to educate in your small city but how can you publish your torah which you believe is the cure to the problems of the generation by writing there is press there is printing. So if you write, and you write well, and you sell, you can change the world. Some people did it in, in Yadut and outside of it. Uh, and he begins to understand that what he needs to be to write is not another Sefer Halacha. He abandons 
the Arzot Achaim that he began to write after only writing two parts. He abandons this project, which, by the way, is, is, is a shame because it was a wonderful Sefer and it's used to this day, but it's very limited in scope because he abandoned it. And instead, he begins to write what would become his magnum opus, and that is uh, his commentary on the Tanakh. Most uh, of the people that I would ask if they know the Mayans, what did he write? People who do not, would not be familiar with this Arzot Achaim. They would be familiar with his Peirush on the Tanakh, Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. Uh, and that is a great work, multi-volume. Now, he begins to understand that's why would he write on the Tanakh? So there are a few reasons. One is because writing on the Talmud, he already understands people are beyond the Talmud. People that are living the way, they do not know Gemara. So writing another commentary on the Gemara, it doesn't speak to them but they still learn Tanakh. So if you'd write on the Tanakh, you have a chance to speak of them, to speak with them. Another point was that the, 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 the Maskilim or the Reform, many times they said, we believe that the Torah Shebikhtav, the written Torah, is from God was already very much doubted, but at least it is an important document that we want to be aligned, to keep in touch with. However, all the things that the rabbis added throughout the generations as their own invitations and should be thrown out of the window. Uh, and what he tried to do was to say, I would say it in our own language, uh, if I may, uh, and that is, you cannot go from the Tanakh to the Palmach. Right? You cannot make this skip over two, three thousand years of Jewish history. But Everything that is part of our history, and I said earlier, he felt the spirit of his fathers in him. So he said everything that is part of Jewish history is part of one continuum. It's all part of the same narrative. So what he endeavored to do was not only to explain the Torah, to write a commentary. He said, I would show you while I explain the Torah, how all of the oral Torah is really not only based, but exists inside the Torah Shebikhtav. That's the project that he took upon himself to reconnect the generations. Now, it's a grand project. And I hope that uh, before finishing the shiur, I would say a few words about the amount of success of the project. He hoped that he is really holding the, the antidote, the cure, to the problems of the Jewish world, that he would publish the books, people would learn it, people would read it, and it would give solution to the uh, erudition of, of Jewish faith. Now, we don't have to go to the end of the shiur and to his legacy to understand that it was beyond that. It was beyond only writing Sepharim. Is, is, is Sepharim uh, Remarkable, uh, excellent. I mean, you don't need my askama. He got the askama of the Khatam Sofer. But uh, but it was beyond writing books. Other things had to be done. Uh, institution, institutions had to be established. Yeshivot had to be built. Do, Jewish day schools. We spoke about that already a few times. So you couldn't just write a Sefer and by that solve the problem. Sometimes people that are very intellectual, so they see the word through intellectual lens. So the problem is philosophical, and the answer would be by writing a very good response to Kant. No, it's, the problem is not what Kant wrote. I mean, people that went, what we call the off the derech, it's not because they read Kant and they got convinced. That's not how life works. It was because of how communities behaved, because of many, many, many factors that writing a book did not answer. But nonetheless, what he did was very important, as I hope to, uh, to speak about. Now, in 1858, he is coming to Bucharest. Now, Bucharest is part of what we call today Romania. But Romania itself is a very long and uh, complicated history because it used to be two different countries, Valachia and, and, and uh, Transylvania. Thank you. And also there was Moldova that now is in separate, but many times it was also uh, combined with them. Uh, and back then what happened was that they uh, integrated Valachia and Transylvania with each other. 
all of that is still under the auspices of the Ottoman Empire. Right? Romania is not independent yet, but it is in the process. It's in the process. So they understand, the Jews understand, the Goim agree, we need to have a cheap rabbi to Romania, which basically is the chief rabbi of Bucharest. And they are doing auditions to the chief rabbi of Romania. Some very important people are going to the auditions. We have, it's very interesting because we have the formal, uh, uh, the formal documents. So he was, uh, the, the Malbim was racing against uh, people like Rashar Hirsch, uh, also tried to become the chief rabbi of Romania. And the results were, he defeated all of them by a margin of more than 100 votes. I mean, that was a very, uh, how would say, a slide, a landslide. Yeah, so it was a very convincing, uh, uh, it was an excellent darshan. That's everyone that heard him. It's always being written that he was an excellent darshan. Now, part of what he would do, back then, Rabbanim would speak, as I said, once or two times a year, and they would speak in a very high level, a very strong, no one would understand. And that was part of, you're a great rabbi, no one understands you. He came to Romania, and he spoke in a way that the simple, he was aiming to what we call today the average Jew. Not, not, not too low, but also not too high. I am interested in speaking with the, the Yosele in the street. So Rav, Rav Yosef, well, he doesn't need me. He's a genius, and I don't need his approval. I am trying to speak to the average Jew. And some people were very, uh, very angry about that because they felt that part of the dignity of the Bucharest or the Romanian community is that we also would have a rabbi that no one can understand. That, that's part of the... I mean, we can, we smile, but it's part, it's, it's part of how it was. And in some places, uh, it's still part of what it is. And uh, uh, so he began to gather enemies. Now, there are different accounts. Obviously, one-on-one, -on -one, he was a very sweet and caring and loving person. But his public figure was a very competitive one. So he was out against the reforms. And he was out against the rich if they wouldn't uh, pay taxes for saving the poor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he was against strong people. He was against, he was against many people. And you do not win many friends by, by speaking every Shabbat and beaming, and, and everyone can understand what you say. <laughs> and, 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 and speaking against all of these very strong elements of the community. So, for example, the reformers wanted to build a temple for themselves, a separate in which obviously they would do whatever they want. Now, it may be that the right decision, the diplomatic decision for him would be to let them build their own thing and keep his own community, which would still the majority. And he was a great rabbi. People loved his sermons. People would come to him. But it was against his nature to let such a thing be built. So he went against them and he made the shochatim, the slaughters, that he, he told them that they are not allowed to sell meat to people that would dive in the new temple. And two shochatim that kept selling meat to them, he put under a ban. So now again, I'm not here, obviously, I'm not in any position to judge him. And he did what he thought was the right way to save his community. But maybe 200 years before, such steps would be uh, accepted, maybe even then not. But uh, maybe 200 years before him, these type of steps could be taken by the local rabbi. We were much beyond that in the 19th century. I mean, we are liberal, we are accepting. We, uh, from where did you come? Immediately from, I mean, from, from medieval times, putting people under ban, not selling meat. What would you do next, lash them? So I am sure that if he was able to, that's what he would have done. Uh, and uh, so all of these, the reform element was very much opposing him. And then he also instructed himself from the rich people, because as I said, he said, he thought in one of the accounts is being described, and this is their words, as an early Bolshevik. Uh, he thought that you should very heavily tax the rich and transfer the money to the poor, to the widows, to the orphans. 
and he was the rabbi. So it was basically under his uh, power to do so. Again, you do not win friends by doing that. I Meaning you win friends, the widows and the orphans, but they would not stand for you because not because they don't want, because they cannot. They cannot. The end of the story was that uh, that uh, some of the, the rich people uh, went to the, the Romanian government. They said, we have a very backward rabbi. The Jews want to advance. They want to become more Romanized. And he's stopping them. Can you please help us get rid of him? And obviously the Roman government immediately said, of course, we'll be happy. Now, again, there are different accounts. The, I'll give you the most dramatic account. There are other. But uh, for our show, let's use the most dramatic one. So going into the most dramatic uh, uh, account, soldiers uh, had um, partzu, stormed, thank you, into the shul on Shabbat while he was giving the drasha and uh, handcuffed him. Uh, in, in the eye view of everyone and took him uh, to jail. He was sentenced to death. That we know. He was sentenced to death for uh, uh, trying to rebel against the Romanian government because he was opposing their attempt to modernize the Jews. Uh, so he was sentenced to death. He was saved by the efforts of Moshe Montefiore from England. So you, you understand what you needed to bring in order to save his life. Uh, and he was expelled from Romania to the rest of his life. So he was just thrown unceremonially uh, behind. After, after he was not killed, <laughs> that's, that's good, but he was just thrown over the border and that was the end of it. He tried to go to the Sultan in Istanbul uh, and uh, asked uh, that, uh, that they would force the Romanian to get him back. But I guess that that the Sultan was no, did not have the power. But, I mean, it was uh, the relationship between the Romanian government and the Sultan was very complicated. I don't think that he was interested in getting into fight for a for, for a Jew, and that 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 was not part of his agenda. Uh, so that was it uh, for uh, the Malbim. From there on, he, he went back to Luncic. and this time he was in trouble because the Maskilim everywhere hated him. And and the Hasidim also didn't like him. There were no Hasidim in Romania back then. But uh, but when he returned to Poland, Hasidus was already very strong. And the Hasidim didn't like him because he was too modern for them. He read Kant. He was he was an open guy. I mean, he was not an open guy, but in, uh, everything is is relative, right? So so they also didn't like him. He was too modern for them. And uh, you know that's the the so the sorry fate. Of everyone that find himself in the crosshairs uh, between between two camps, so he was he began to wander from place to place. I can name you the the cities. So Luncic, the Hasidim called him Harava Germani, right? The German rabbi. He was not a German in any way, but but they call him the German again to make fun of him because he's so modern. Uh, and then he continued to Kherson, which now is famous for uh, for the war there in Ukraine. To Mugilev, which is now Mohaliv, Shmuel Mohaliv, maybe the name is familiar, it's from the uh, Königsberg. Königsberg is a, is a, is a German city. Uh, so you, but everywhere you're thrown away. May I can give you a few stories just. <laughs> now, again, all of them may be completely fiction. All of the stories may be completely fiction, but uh, just to make uh, it, again, even if the story is made up, as they say, they do not tell these stories about me, right? So even if you make up a story about someone, it teaches you something about the reality. So according to one story, on Purim, he got a Mishloach Manot from one of the Maskilim of, of, the, of the city. And the Mishloach Manot was a, a sugar candy, but in the form of a pig. So he got that. And, uh, and with a messenger. So he paid the messenger and, and, and gave him a picture of himself and told him, tell the sender that Mayor, uh, excuse me, that, uh, yeah, that Mayor Leibush is thanking him for uh, the picture of himself that he sent him and he's sending his own picture back. Uh, so this was the time, I mean, again, this is not a, 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 right, a, a normal rabbi story, but that was the type of relationship he had with these people. And, and you can understand that's when your relationship are, then you would make yourself enemies. Uh, and 
I mean, the one thing is to make yourself enemies, but the question is, is it effective? <laughs> was it effective in stopping the reform in, in Romania? It was not. It was thrown away. Was it effective in stopping Ascala in Germany? No, it was not. What was effective were the books uh, that, he, that, he, that he wrote. So let's speak a little about the Safarim, as I said, his great uh, uh, war, <laughs> which is the Peirush on the Tanakh. As I said, what he was trying to do was to show how the Torah Shepichtav and the Torah Shebaal Peh are completely intertwined. So Jewish history is one thing. You cannot chop it and throw pieces if you do not like them, which I find very inspiring. I think that anything that we do in our tradition is A, we are doing it because God commanded it and that's, I mean, that, that's, that's the truth, that's what we should do. But it is also very empowering that we are not doing it standing alone. When we begin to feel we say, Magen, Hashem, Elokeinu, Elokei Avraham, Elokei Yitzchak, so we immediately begin by mentioning our forefathers. We never stand alone in front of Hashem. We come from the community and from the, our families and from everything that we came from. If I may, even having a shiur, le'ilu nishmat, is a part of the same, I did part of the same message, part of the same um, movement in which we say we are, we are part of one big chain. And he felt it very, very strongly. And when you read his, his, his safari, you can be more convinced sometimes from what he's trying to, to teach you. Sometimes it's less convincing, but it's always inspiring how much he is, what amount of effort he's willing to put because of his belief that everything is connected and that, that every generation is sitting on the shoulders of the generation that came before it, so one uh, one exam one example, uh, I would go immediately to. Our time is very short. Uh, let's go to to the last source, and you know you have the sources here, and you can uh, learn some of the things that they gave afterwards. That is from the haftara that we read uh, this Shabbat. So we read Yeshaya chapter sixty six, which is the last chapter of Yeshayahu. And we have a beautiful passage there about, uh, about the redemption and about nechama, consolation. And the, the Navi says there, Simchu et Yerushalayim vegilu ba kol ohaveya. So you should be happy with Yerushalayim, should rejoice. Everyone that loves Yerushalayim should rejoice. Si su itam asos, you would rejoice with it. Kol amitablim aleha. The people that are mourning for Yerushalayim would one day rejoice in it. That's the, the final chapter of Yeshayahu. And now the Malbim has a rule. There are no redundant words in, uh, in the Kitvei Kodesh. Nothing. Adam Mephashim would sometimes say, yeah, it's the same thing, uh, but in poetry you are allowed to repeat yourself for the enhancement of the, of the poem. The Malbim would have nothing of it. He says, every change of a word has a meaning. So he says, yes, there is a difference between simcha, gil, vemasos. Each one of these words convey a slightly different message. He says, simcha ve gil morim ala simcha shebalev. They are the inner feeling of happiness. And what is the difference in simcha and gil? It says simcha is the concept, consent feature when you're happy and that is something that is present progressive, it is going on. And uh, Gil is something that happens. It's surprising you. Suddenly you are being told something that makes you happy. So again, Simcha is mood and uh, and Gil is an effect. Can I say that? Okay, so that is Simcha, that is Gil. Now what is Masos? I turn it as rejoicing. Masos, he says, is the external deeds. So I can be happy, but I have a poker face. I'm seeing, and I'm happy inside. Masos is when I am dancing around. So says the Mal, this is a beautiful thing. He says, Simchu et Yerushalayim vegilu bakolo avea. Everyone will love Yerushalayim. When you see the redemption, you would be happy, and you would be surprisingly happy. But the one that are now mitablim, the people that are keeping the 
morning practices, Isha Be'ab, on Shlosh Tashavot, now we are in Sfirat HaOmer. So the people that are also practicing their feelings, they do not only keep their feelings inside, they practice. So when the happiness would come, they would also practice. Sisu itam asos, kol amitab limalea. If you are putting into action your feelings when you are sad for Yerushalayim, then you would also merit to put into action your feelings when you'd be happy for Yerushalayim. So you see how beautifully he connects. So he sees every word is different. He connects the minhagim. Now the minhagim of Veilut are not written in the Torah or in the Navi for that matter. But he is trying to bring not everything, con connect everything with each other so you would have one long chain. So our minhagim of Avelut would become minhagim of Simcha and all of that is already said by the Navi 3,000 years ago. So that makes the whole Jewish history, as I said, into one continuum. And I, again, for him, I think that was the major uh, intention that he had uh, in his work, it's both in the Agada, in the Halacha. I mean, we can. Uh, there is a lot to read here, uh, and there is also a lot more to say. In 1839, he got an offer to become the chief rabbi of New York, which was. It would have been interesting if he would have accepted, but he was already old, and I mean, not old for us, but for him, it was an old age, and he was sick, and he was. Uh, he had enough fights. I think he just couldn't bring himself to go to a new land and rebegin everything. And to be honest, I don't think he would have succeeded. Then. New York needed a different type of rabbi back. Not that he had, that it had, but it needed a different type of rabbi that would be able to speak with everyone. He was not the type. I think everything that we said up till now clearly was not the type. So he rejected. It was an interesting antidote, and the antidote that he, he got this uh, suggestion. He rejected. Instead, he accepted a suggestion to become the Rav of Kremchung in Russia. Unfortunately, in the way to this Kremchung, he got sick, got ill in the way, and died uh, in the way and was buried. We know the cemetery where he is buried, but we do not even know where the, I think, uh, maybe they found it, uh, where the cave is uh, in Kiev. Uh, the whole thing is uh, bittersweet. It's bittersweet. It's bitter because in his personal life, he was not able to have the effect that he wanted to have. And uh, and he was not able to create in Romania a thriving Torah life that he was really, he, he, he strove to, to do so. Uh, but on the other hand, the book that he wrote, and he wrote it, as I said, as an antidote, as a solution to a specific problem that he was having. But it's, it was a, a, a success. It was a success. Uh, it is being learned to this day. It's a wonderful sefer. It's not very easy and it's lengthy. Back then, everyone that wrote something had to write in length. I'm not sure why, but I think it's very long. Uh, so, so it's long and you need to have the time, set the time in order to learn it. But it's beautiful. It's beautiful. So much thought invested into every detail of the Torah, uh, of the Nevim, and uh, in this, I think in this sense, then his legacy is one of, uh, of the ability, even in very difficult circumstances that he had from the beginning of his life to his end, to the end. Very, very difficult life. He was still able to create something that is long lasting and became, I think, and that was his main goal, became part of the Jewish tradition and the Jewish chain that is so uh, uh, revered and uh, and fight to protect and in that sense it is a sweet uh, ending story so again thank you very much and uh, the everything that we said today would be leilu nishmat tova bat natan we will meet bezot hashem next week thank you in Malbin, yeah, there is but i think it's it's the short and it's it's a, it's part of the it's part of the film it's not the whole thing. I, mean, I guess it depends on the version because it's a lot but it is i think is the last in the in the meaning uh, chronically speaking, he's the last one to make it into the micro dollar into being a classical commentator. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Today, very bye. Much. Today. Thank you. Yeah, I will see.